Sunday, 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 10 a.m. Come experience a taste of real life. Do you have problems? Jesus, Jesus, Jesus can help. Jesus solves many problems such as depression, diabetes, disobedient children, disobedient parents, disobedient dogs, financial problems, personal problems, even hygiene problems. The best of all, it's free, free, free. Church will ask for a minimum 10% tithe, given with a cheerful heart at a later date. Don't miss out on Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Come now before it's too late. People understand the commercial is a joke, right? Well, sure. You don't have to explain satire. I'm using hyperbole to explore the pressure that churches feel to commercialize the gospel, but I'm not actually making fun of Jesus. Hey everybody, welcome to Thoughtful Thursdays, a place where my handsome and thoughtful husband likes to share his insights and research. I don't know about you, but throughout my Christian experience, I have felt an immense pressure to be a Jesus salesman. Successful Christians influence people around them to also be successful Christians, and the entire thing builds and builds and builds and builds until every single person in the world bows to Jesus. And then he can come back and send all the jerks that didn't listen to or accept our sales pitch into an eternal lake of fire. From telemarketers to door-to-door -door salesmen to obnoxious shop workers, someone trying to sell you a product you don't want is among the world's most annoying things. Right out there with chewing with your mouth open and that student in my classroom who asked the same question that I just answered 10 seconds ago. I hate feeling like I'm being manipulated into buying something. This pressure to sell Jesus, and in Christian circles we tend to call this evangelism, can really pollute our relationships because people become a means to an end. I need you to love Jesus because that makes me a good Christian. It's manipulation with a loving motive. We learn all kinds of methods about how to meet people, develop a relationship, share our story, and pray for the other person. And if we do all of that just right, the other person will see what we have, want that, and they will join up with the Jesus gang. Now, there is nothing wrong with stepping outside of our comfort zone and meeting people. There is nothing wrong with intentionally pursuing and investing in relationships. Those are really good things to do, and sharing our story can be a powerful experience. I love hearing other people's stories. Praying for people can be kind and loving, but when our primary motive is to love someone to Jesus, it sets up the other person to feel duped when they find out. And I feel like a failure if it doesn't happen or if it doesn't happen fast enough. This model puts a lot of pressure on the budding new connections that we're forming. Look at this another way. My faith encourages me to care about people, to love them, to treat them as I want to be treated. It can and should motivate me to step out of my comfort zone, meet people, invest in relationships, listen to their story, and share my own when appropriate. The end goal is a healthy, thriving relationship where before there was none. Creating positive connections is the reward in and of itself. This model removes that pressure. When we sell Jesus, we have to be the perfect witness. We have to assume that we have something to give other people that they want. We are the teachers, we have the answers, we are doing it right. It's hard to maintain the stature of a learner when we assume the moral high ground and if we're always instructing and guiding. Instead of being curious about the world around us and about other people, we feel a need to promote our specific brand of beliefs. What if instead we could assume that Jesus is working in the life of every person we encounter. We have an incredible opportunity to learn about Jesus' individual work in each person by looking to learn, by asking questions. So for instance, in a recent bout of insomnia, I randomly read this book. And the author describes in horrifying detail her childhood escape from a wealthy, beautiful home through the mountains of Afghanistan on foot when the country broke out in war. She and her siblings traveled without their parents. They stayed in small villages. They slept on the ground. They wore the same clothes for days on end. They were always hungry. At one point, they accidentally followed a path right between flying missiles. They were just trying to make it to the border. And then when they finally arrived in Pakistan, their father had given them nothing more than a hotel address where he planned to meet them. They stayed on their own in that hotel for six months, watching their money dwindle away, eating only milk and bread, not knowing if their father had been captured or shot or would ever appear. It was a stunning account. I had two takeaways from this book. First, the author and Gila came from a life of total privilege. A cook prepared multiple course meals for her family daily. 
maids cleaned her room, and as a child, she was completely ignorant to the impoverished reality of most of the Afghan people. Her eyes were open to their hard knock lives, the lives of the children she encountered. She met child brides, orphans, children sold away by parents who couldn't afford to feed them. Her revelation and understanding of poverty really appealed to me because I had a similar, although certainly less dramatic, experience the first time I went to Mexico. I wish I could easily give my students that kind of experience. It's so much easier to judge impoverished people when you don't know any. It's easier to take our unmerited privilege of being born at this time and place into the family we were born into for granted when we haven't become friends with people living a radically different existence. But my second takeaway from this book was the author's profound faith. In the middle of all the trauma around her, she held tightly to her personal faith. She prayed regularly, she recited religious poetry, and she found God in beautiful places, even in the middle of all the uncertainty and danger. Her faith uplifted her and enriched her life. It helped her find meaning. She credited her resilience through this experience to her faith. She also denounced people who used her beloved Islam to justify atrocities. When I read her story, I felt uplifted. It's encouraging to see people face evil and survive on guts and faith. If I'm selling Jesus and converting every single person around me is my ultimate goal, a woman's deep Islamic convictions are kind of a threat to that goal, and anyone who doesn't believe what I believe is a threat. So instead of learning from and appreciating someone else's story and experience, I have to reject it. I have to find flaws or fear it. Here's the thing. I'm convinced that selling Jesus is a bad strategy, particularly in the modern Western context, and it's probably a bad strategy in other contexts too, but here it's overdone. People smell the manipulation miles away. It's too much pressure. It hurts instead of healing. If we trust Jesus to be Jesus, and if we can be ourselves and open and honest about our faith, equally open and honest about our failures, our struggles, without that overhead pressure of convincing everyone to buy into what we have, That allows us to become learners. Our own faith can be enriched through the time-honored wisdom and value in other religions, faiths, and walks of life. Now, reading that book in the middle of the night didn't encourage me to become Muslim at all. Rather, it encouraged me to look for parallels in my own faith, in my Christianity, and to imagine how my personal faith might support me if I found myself in a terrible circumstance. People of other faiths are not a threat. They're a source of wisdom and learning, encouragement for our own faith. Sometimes we wanna box Jesus up into this tiny little section of our brain and think that we can only connect with him through very intentional prayer, church attendance, and Bible reading. But if the verse, pray without ceasing, includes breathing, as I've heard it described before, everything we do can be a holy moment. Every person we meet has some precious nugget of God if we patiently wait and ask the right questions. So I quit. I'm done. I'm done selling Jesus. You know, other than making this video and generally being myself, which is highly opinionated, I'm officially no longer Jesus' publicist. I'm not trying to make anyone be a Christian. Instead, I want to slow down. I want to notice the people that are around me. I want to share the things that I have with a heart of generosity. I also want to learn from other people. I I want to be uplifted and encouraged by the stories of the people around me and likewise be able to uplift and encourage. I don't want anyone to be a threat. With a new model, we can be excited about spending time with every person that we encounter and figure out where Jesus is moving in each person's life. I'm pretty excited about that. That's the life I want to live. So thanks for tuning in. Kyle will be right back next time. I'm sure you've all missed him. Let him know because he's the best and we'll see you right back here next Thursday. Thanks.